Welcome back colleagues to KSU's Research with Relevance Friday Features. Um, this is the fifth show of our fall season. Uh, we have had shows regularly scheduled every two weeks. Um, I hope you all uh, had the opportunity to join us um, two weeks ago with Greg Phelan and Heidi Holmes uh, from the Col Coles College of Business. They shared with us some of their um, exciting research in um, the field of education ec and economics. My name is Phaedra Corso and I'm the Vice President for Research here at KSU. Um, it's my honor to be the host of Research with Relevance. Um, and for those of you who've been participating all along, you know the reason why we do this is because we live in a strange world of pandemic and we don't get to see each other as often as we would like. So this is a way for us to, to place a stamp on 4 p.m. at Fridays at KSU to say it's all about research and we love to share with you some of the exciting research faculty that we have. Um, so we're really um, thankful that you're here joining us. We have a great show today. I got to tell you, um, I'm super excited to talk to Clint today. He's got some really fun research going on and, and so we'll introduce him in a second. Um, just to remind you about some of the housekeeping tips. Um, first, please make sure that your mics are muted until the end when we open up for questions. Um, if you want to ask a question at the end, of course, you can send your um, your questions through chats and I'm happy if you have that function and I'm happy to read the questions for you. But I also encourage you to raise your hand or to just uh, charge in and ask a question because it's a lot more fun if it's not just um, me and the speaker, um, if, if it's a more engaged um, atmosphere. So the schedule for the next hour is that we will first start by watching a video which gives us an overview of the researcher that we're featuring featuring today and that's Clint Pennick. Um, and then we'll do a live interview with Clint. Um, before we begin, I'd like to get, uh, share with you a little background about Clint. So he is an assistant professor in the College of Science and Mathematics, and he joined KSU last fall, and you're going to see he's done quite a bit since he's been here. So um, that's pretty wonderful to see how quickly he's moving in the, in the world of research. Uh, he's in the Department of Ecology, Evolution, and, and Biology. His research that we'll be hearing about today focuses on the evolution and ec ecological success of social insects such as ants and bees. He takes an integrative approach that combines techniques in ecology, physiology, behavior, and evolution. And he earned his PhD in biology from Arizona State University. We're super glad that you're here with us today, Clint. And we're going to start off with a short video that was prepared by my team. And in particular, a big thanks to Tom Boyle, who has just figured this out so quickly. And we could do videos like this every day if we wanted to. Um, but we, but we're, we're going to stick with every two weeks. Um, so with that, Heather, I'm going to turn it over to you to share the video. <laughs> My name is Clint Pinnock, and I'm an assistant professor of biology in the College of Science and Mathematics. And also, I'm an ant biologist. Yes, ants. When you tell someone that you're an ant biologist, two questions inevitably come up. First, can you tell me what the ants are in my kitchen? And second, how do I get rid of them? Well, my research might help you answer that first question. But as for the second, I'm more interested in what we can learn from ants and other insects than I am in trying to figure out new ways to get rid of them. When I first got interested in research, I thought that big discoveries happened someplace far away. You had to get on a plane and fly somewhere like the Amazon. But the first research I ever actually published was a study I conducted on ants living in my own backyard. The idea that you could study ants pretty much anywhere has stuck with me for the rest of my career. I've now gotten to study ants in places that range from the jungles of India to my most recent work on the streets of New York City. For the last six years, my collaborators and I have been studying the ants of New York to understand how cities affect biodiversity more broadly. So far, we've identified over 40 ant species living in Manhattan, which is slightly more than have been found in the nearest natural habitat outside the city. And we found that not only are ants in New York diverse, but they're also abundant. Based on our collections, we estimate that there are at least 16 billion ants living in the city. To put this another way, ants outnumber human residents of New York by 2,000 to one. So how does a city like New York support so many ants and other urban animals? 
Although urban habitats have fewer plants and other food sources that wild populations depend on, what they have instead is garbage, and they have a lot of it. Using stable isotopes of carbon, my students and I trace human foods through urban food webs. What we found is that the species that do best in cities are those that are best able to find and eat our trash. Just along Broadway, we estimate that ants are eating the equivalent in weight of 10,000 hot dogs per year. We tend to think of the ants living on our sidewalks and in our homes as pests, but some of them are fascinating in their own right. Just like us, ants live in dense societies and must defend themselves against disease. Also like us, ants have figured out how to produce their own antibiotics. My lab recently developed the first rapid technique to measure ant-produced antibiotics. And we started this project by testing the ants living in our homes and in our cities. Of all the ants we've tested so far, the one with the most potent antibiotic by far was a tiny species that I found living in a tree stump in my own front yard. Students in my lab at Kennesaw State University are continuing the search for new ant species that produce antibiotics. And we're also trying to learn how ants prevent pathogens from developing antibiotic resistance, a problem ants seem to have solved, but we still haven't. And it's not just ants we're looking at to learn new tricks. In early 2020, our lab received funding from NASA to study how structural properties of bee honeycomb can be used to improve 3D printing design. Honeycomb has fascinated scientists for millennia, since the Roman scholar Marcus Varro first speculated about why bees build their nests using hexagons. Our lab is now working with 3D printing engineers to look at honeycomb in more detail. What we've been learning so far is that bees and wasps build the cells of their comb with rounded corners. Most engineers, on the other hand, build honeycomb with sharp corners but it turns out that rounding the corners of each hexagon improves the strength to weight ratio of the entire structure. A new graduate student in my lab is taking this project further to see what else we can learn about structural design from bees. Five years ago, I would have never thought that I would be doing research with NASA on bees to develop better aerospace parts, but that's what's great about science. It will take you to places that you never expected. Kennesaw State University has turned out to be the perfect place to build these types of interdisciplinary projects and to push this research forward from the sidewalk to the moon. Thanks. That's terrific, Clint. Uh, welcome. Let's make sure that your mic is on, that we can hear you. All right. Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear okay. me? I can hear you. Perfect. All right. Well, I have a million questions, um, and but I, I don't want to like completely take over uh, the entire show. But I want to start with your ants and your ants of New York, and and talk about um, the antibiotics. So let me just back up from antibiotics for a second to say, did they? Um, is the whole idea around them creating antibiotics because they experience pandemic? in similar ways that humans experience pandemic? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, humans, I think it's, you know, in the last 10 years or so, we've passed a major threshold in our development. We're now that over 50% of people living today live in cities. Um, and so it's the first time that we're truly an urban species. So for most of our history, we've been living in relatively small societies and not nearly as in dense conditions as we are in today. Ants, on the other hand, have been living in dense societies for over 100 million years. And so this is one of the reasons why we think that ants have had to evolve to deal with diseases over such a long time. So as soon as you live in these really dense colonies, uh, the chance for you know, transmitting a disease from one ant to another um, rapidly increases. And then there's, you know, you, there's selection pressure on pests um, and diseases themselves in order to, um, to get inside these colonies. And so it's no surprise really that ants have figured out ways uh, to deal with disease. But what's been surprising is that they figured out a way to, to do so um, with antibiotics that seems not to lead to antibiotic resistance. And that's obviously something that humans are having a lot of challenges with today. We have uh, superbugs like MRSA and C. diff. Uh, and so now we're interested in trying to figure out how ants prevent things like that from developing. And and I, I don't know if it's too technical for, for you to explain it to a lay audience, but how do they develop antibiotics? Like, what is the process? 
So they, they produce them physio, uh, physiologically. So they have glands all over their bodies. Um, ants are often referred to as nature's chemist. Um, some of them have, you know, over a dozen different glands that produce um, compounds. Some of them are used for pheromones to communicate with each other. Other ones, they produce venom and things that, that hurt when they sting us. Um, but then there's other glands within their bodies that produce things that are antibiotic. Um, and that's not specific to ants. So we do the same thing, actually. So humans, we have natural um, antibiotics that we produce and exude through our skin that that uh, present one line of defense for us. So it's not something necessarily unique to ants. But what we're finding is that um, that most ant species tend to have pretty strong broad spectrum antibiotics that they produce. OK, sticking with the ants for a second. So you talked about, um, you know, you're looking at all, the whole ant. You're not just looking at the physiology, the biology, but also the social part. And so um, in, in thinking about these, you said 40 species of ants that live in Manhattan, do they tend to um, commingle across their species or are they territorial? Do they, you know, are there boroughs of ants set up in, in certain <laughs> parts of New York City? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, so the most common ant in New York City is one of my favorite ants of all time. They're called the pavement ant. Um, they have that name because they, they live in cities and they basically followed humans around the world wherever we build cities and put pavement down. They've um, probably lived, been living with humans since, uh, you know, the times of the Roman Empire. So this is a, a really old connection um, between our two species. Um, and so they're originally from Europe. They came to the United States and they're now the most common ant in New York City. They're the most common ant in Chicago, San Francisco. We don't have them here in Atlanta. We're a little bit too hot for them. They're, they're a little bit further north, but they've made it to places like in South America and stuff like that, too. Um, but they are one of the things they're famous for besides being associated with cities is that they they defend their territories. Um, they, they defend very discrete territories. And so one of the cool things uh, it, when you work in urban ecology that you see each year is in the spring, you'll see these piles of pavement ants. And if you get on your knees and look a little bit closer at them, um, you can see they're all grappling with each other. And so they basically, they fight and they push their, their territorial lines back and forth and one of the interesting things about it is that they don't actually kill each other. Um, in some ways, they're kind of counting the numbers of other ants in the colony next to them. So every ant grabs a partner from the other colony. And then if one colony realizes, hey, like I don't have any partners, I think our colony is winning and doing better, they'll start moving closer. And so you'll see these these uh, these battles develop. Um, we're hoping we were actually this summer we were supposed to film with um, the BBC Planet Earth um, to 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 film some of these uh, these battles, but it was it was canceled this this year. Hopefully next year um, it'll be a little bit better. Um, but one of the cool things about it is that once these are established. They respect them for the rest of the year, so the battle doesn't happen anymore after that. Um, and but then again, again the next year it happens again, so it's cool. I've seen these um, erupt, you know, in my own front yard when I was living in North Carolina. Um, I've seen them in San Francisco and Baltimore, all over, all over the place. They're, they're fairly common. Uh, but if you go, you know, zoom out past like this one specialist urban species, the pavement ant, and you look at all the 40 species we have in New York, what you do tend to see is that there's a subset of those species that are really common in what we call highly urban habitats, which is places like on the sidewalk and on those tiny little green patches on Broadway. But then the majority of species, um, like 30 or so, are found almost exclusively in, in remnant forest or areas of Central Park or Inwood Hill, um, these areas throughout Manhattan that have kind of more tree cover and stuff like that. So interesting. Has there, this is probably outside your field of research, but has anyone mapped it? Like, like geo mapped where the, the ant species live? We have some of this. So, um, so my colleague Amy Savage, who who really began a lot of this research, um, she went out and then yeah did do a biodiversity sample of Manhattan, and it was based on that research that we realized, hey, there's you know about half a dozen species or so that seem to be really successful in these highly urban areas. And my question was, why is that? What's special about these ultra urban ants that makes them do well in human cities? And so then that's what we've been building on over the last five years. Um, we tend to go to New York. Almost every summer, I bring groups of students up there um, and we do research um, trying to figure out characteristics of these, these um, half a dozen species 
that make them do really well in cities. And now I, we're hoping to do the same thing in Atlanta. And Atlanta has actually never been sampled for, me, for ants. And I think this is one of the things, you know, when I first got into urban ecology and, and I thought about doing work in, in Manhattan and in New York, I thought, you know, what am I going to learn? I mean, people have been living in Manhattan for so long. Um, it, actually, you know, there's the American Museum of Natural History, which is in Central Park. It has one of the largest ant collections in, in the entire world. It's a famous area. And we thought, you know, surely people have figured out everything there is to learn about ants in New York. And it turned out that couldn't be further from the truth. So when we started working there, we went to the American Museum. We said, hey, we'd like to look at, you know, ant species that have been collected in New York over time. And they went back to their collection and realized that they didn't have a single ant from New York City in their collection. And this, again, is one of the largest collections in the world for ants. And it's literally located in Central Park, like right next to where we where we work. So that tends to be the norm. You know, places like Atlanta, there, there hasn't been probably any research on urban ants. A lot of cities are the same way. So we're really just starting to to get that base level of knowledge to ask more sophisticated questions. So what are your hypotheses about the ants that you're going to find in Atlanta? I mean, obviously we're a different temperature, so I just assume that the species will look a little bit different, but what what are you hypothesizing? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the big things is that we expect there to be more species. So if New York has 40 ant species, I suspect Atlanta might have 100, at, at probably at least 100 species that we would find in the city. And that's just partly that biodiversity trends in general, as you go closer to the equator, you tend to have more species. Um, also, most of the species we find in New York are a completely different, like subgroup of ants. They're more specialized on uh, northern forests. Um, they're not very heat tolerant. So things like the pavement ant that do great in New York, they make it down into North Carolina a little bit, but then they've, they've definitely gotten replaced by fire ants. And so what I expect to see when we go into Atlanta is that fire ants are, are taking over and performing the role that pavement ants do in these northern cities. But that's just a hunch right now. Um, but we expect, you know, similar, similar stuff that the ants are probably relying on human foods in these urban areas. One of the really interesting things we found so far, um, and, and when we've looked at other cities, so we haven't wor worked in Atlanta yet, but we've worked in, in North Carolina, we've worked in New Orleans and, and Philadelphia. And we've been repeating this study where you basically let ants pick their favorite food. So it's called a cafeteria experiment. We give them sugar and fat and protein and water. And then we just, we just count the ants after a couple hours who recruit to whichever of those food sources. And normally when you run this study, people, you know, school kids do this. It's a very common, uh, a very common study. Um, and, and what happens is most of the ants go for sugar. I think most people would guess you drop some sugar on the ground, the ants go for it. When we did this study in, in New York and our highly urban areas, 90% of the ants went to fat. They went to oil. And this is something that's almost never happened in any study around the world. For some reason, you know, maybe usually they pick sugar, sometimes they pick protein. And we thought, well, this might be something weird about the New York ants. And now we've repeated it in, in three other major cities and it happens every single time. Um, so it seems like there's something about being an urban ant, eating human garbage, and then getting some taste for fat. We don't exactly uh, know exactly what's going on, but I do predict that some of the, the big trends we're, we're you know, finding in New York are also going to hold true for Atlanta. So that makes me think, I wonder if it's going to hold true for other cities outside of the United States. Because it's, if it's based on what they're eating, and our food here is just so much different than what you might see in a European city, maybe you'll find yeah. differences. You would definitely see differences. And actually the way we were, um, so I, I basically had to develop a new method to figure out how much human foods ants eat. So if you study something like coyotes or rats, you can do things like scat analysis and look at what they've eaten and kind of pick through it. But with ants, they're so tiny, you know, most of the time you can't see what they're eating. It would be too difficult. And um, the, I, I basically got a clue from watching a documentary about humans where they, they said they could take a hair sample from someone living in the United States and a hair sample from someone living in Europe, and they could tell us apart based on our carbon stable isotope um, content. And so it, just, and it turns out that's because that in North America, the base of a lot of our human foods um, goes back to corn. And corn has this particular signature where they have a higher amount of the heavy isotope of carbon, carbon-13. Um, 
And so when we eat things that um, that are either corn themselves, like corn syrup, um, or if we eat things that have eaten corn, like hamburgers, you know, most of our, our um, beef and chickens are corn fed. Even when we eat those, we have this corn signature. Um, and then in Europe, it tends to be soy and some other things that don't have that same signature. And so that was when we got I, I got this idea, basically, like, I, well, if we look different from from Europeans because of the, the food we're eating, I wonder if when ants eat our food, they start to look more like we do. And it turns out exactly. Yes, that, that's what they do. And so there is something unique about uh, what ants are, are, are feeding on in, in North America. They're cer certainly getting more corn in their diet, more corn syrup. Um, but but I suspect some of the stuff they're getting just more sugars um, in, across the board, which might be similar across other cities. Great. I, I could ask a million questions on this alone, so I'm going to um, open it up for people to start asking questions. There's one that's come into chats already uh, from Jennifer Cooper. She asks, how closely related are neighboring ant colonies of the same species? That's a great question. And so, you know, ants, uh, they, they tend to be territorial and hate their neighbors worse than anybody else. Like ants probably wouldn't make good neighbors if you were if you were another ant. So they defend their, their territories um, pretty seriously. Um, but we actually don't know in, in Manhattan um, how uh, basically species are distributed, um, how um, they're sharing genes throughout the city. We've never done studies on that. And we suspect that um, when you have fragmentation, you have like, you know, for example, there's a lot of species that we find in Central Park, but they're not anywhere else in the city until you go maybe up to the northern end of Manhattan and um, there's Inwood Hill Park, which is a little bit further away. And so what we suspect is there might be some barriers to gene flow so that you would find um, kind of a high relatedness within species that are that are specific to Central Park versus Inwood Hill um, or some of the other parks we've looked like looked at. Um, I have a colleague who's based in New York who studies rats. He, he's the, the New York rat guy. And, and so they've actually, they have done these types of studies and they've tracked gene flow through New York City's rat populations. And they find that that absolutely is true, that there's certain pockets, um, depending on what park or area of the city or th that the rats are in, they tend to be much more genetically related. Um, and then they kind of figured out these little pathways that rats take through the city and they can map this through gene flow. And they show how rats are, you know, over time moving and, and breeding with each other throughout the city. And so I think it would be really exciting to do something like that with ants. So um, this is totally in parentheses, but um, does the New York rat guy call you the New York ant guy? Probably, yes, uh, almost certainly. <laughs> okay, there's another question that's come in from Lori Meadows. Uh, the question is, does your study include incidents of ant mimicry located during your field research? Um, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but in terms of, you know, ants have a lot of, of um, other insect species that mimic them that look like ants. There's um, the pavement ant has uh, certain things that sneak into their nest, um, uh, things that are like, uh, they tend to not look like ants, they tend to smell like ants. So a lot of ant species have crickets that live in their nest with them and they're really cute. They're the smallest cricket in the world. Um, they're called myrmecophiles. Um, uh, because they're, they're ant loving. That's what that means. Myrmica file. Myrm means ant and file means loving. Um, and so they figured out ways that they kind of exude the similar chemicals that ants produce. And so they can sneak into ant nests um, without getting eaten. Um, and so I haven't worked on any of those myself, but I do come across them pretty regularly. Uh, before we switch over to bees, um, I, I know we have some engineers on the on the call today who will probably want to ask you some questions about that. But just can you give us a little bit of background on how uh, KSU is so fortunate that you came to us to be a faculty <laughs> member? Oh, no, I, it's definitely the other way around. I feel very, very happy, especially in these times to, to have a faculty position here. And for me, you know, I grew up about five hours south of Kennesaw. So I grew up in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, that's where I did my undergrad. And that's where I really fell in love with ant research. And so my first research was on fire ants. I know, you know, 99.9% .9 of the public hates fire ants. I'm in the 0.01% the that loves them. Um, and, and I've done a lot of work throughout my career on um, ant communities in the southeast. So all of our antibiotic work, for, for example, has been done on a lot of the same species we have here at Kennesaw. Um, and so for me, um, it, it's been really nice to come back to the southeast. I've been in Arizona and North Carolina for the last eight to 10 years or so between graduate school and postdocs. Um, 
And so I think it's just a really great place to do the type of research that I'm doing. Atlanta, you know, is one of these fastest growing cities. It's it's really a city of the future. And if we want to understand how people are going to be interacting with nature, you know, in the next 50 or 100 years, I would pick Atlanta as one of the number one cities in the world to understand that. More people are moving to Atlanta. Um, we're coming into closer contact with species in the, in the Southeast region. And I think it's really an ideal place to do research like this. I am. I have a, um, a sunbeam that keeps following me around my room, so I apologize about that. Um, so uh, how about students? Do you? I heard you mention that you bring students with you to New York to collect data. Um, do you work with undergrads, graduate students? Who, who's on your team? Yeah I, yeah, I work with both. And so this is only my second year here at Kennesaw. Um, so my first year, I was very fortunate to send out an email to the advanced majors group and had a bunch of students respond. Um, who wanted to get experience doing research. And so I took on five five undergraduate students last year. Almost all of them were freshmen. They were, they were new to Kennesaw, it was their first semester. And by the end of that semester, they had all learned how to identify ants to species, which is actually really difficult. It literally requires counting hairs on the back of an ant. Um, and so, um, so I was very impressed with their ability to do that. And then they started working through samples that we had collected from cities throughout the entire um, Eastern coast. And so we're now working on a paper that all of those students are co-authors on um, that's written up now. So we've, we've analyzed everything and hopefully in the next month or two, we're gonna be ready to submit. Um, so it, I've really been impressed with the with the undergraduate students. I have um, probably yeah four or five now who, who have joined the lab this year as well. Um, and a lot of those students have, have come back. Um, and then just at the beginning of this semester, I took on three graduate students. So one of them was hired to work on our NASA project on honeybees, and she's also looking at wasp nests. Um, I have another one who has hired on a new USDA grant that we just officially got the funding a couple weeks ago. Um, but this is a big four year study to look at pollinators in urban areas. So we're going to be working in Atlanta and Athens, uh, but this is a, a collaborative project where we're also going to be working in places like Detroit, Phoenix, Arizona, Denver, a bunch of places all over the US. Um, and then a third student who's doing some work with me on um, ant cuticle sculpture, in which maybe we'll talk about in a minute, uh, but it's tied to some of the, the science art projects that we have going in our lab as well. Yeah, let's definitely talk about that at the end. We've got uh, questions are rolling in, so let's let's go back to it. The next one is when you say urban ants, I assume we can still find those in their natural environment as well. If so, has anybody looked into their selective preference towards fats when not in the urban setting? Yeah, great question. So with the pavement ants, um, we haven't studied them in their natural habitat, which actually uh, with a lot of these urban pest species, we actually don't know where they're, act they're from. We do not know what their natural habitat is. So people suspect that pavement ants live in these grassy areas in Europe. Um, they can kind of find them there sometimes, um, but they're still usually pretty close to cities. Um, there's a lot of other pest ants that get into our houses that people literally don't they literally don't know where they're from. Um, so sometimes they, they they specify general regions of Asia that they think maybe, but but we're still figuring this out. Um, but as far as uh, whether they have a preference for fats, if they're living outside the city or inside the city, we do know that for pavement ants. So when we do the same study um, in like Central Park and the other park areas in New York that are more natural and they're, they're not feeding on human foods in those sites, we know because we've done their stable isotope work. When we do those studies there, it's literally the complete opposite. It's 90 percent of them go for sugars. So when we do this study within pavement ants alone, um, their preference shifts you know, within two blocks, the ants that we test in Central Park and the ants we test in Broadway, they're going for two completely different things. It's been consistent. We've now done this experiment multiple years, multiple times, multiple cities, and we're finding the same thing every time. So it seems really robust. But there are some really interesting changes with ants uh, that people have found between their natural and urban populations. Um, one of the coolest ones, I think, is um, there's an ant called the odorous house ant. Um, it has that name because it stinks. It smells like blue cheese um, if you crush them so you can identify them based on smell if they're in your house. Um, they're the number one house pest in New York City. They're, they're also probably, I think they come, we're about at their southern range, but they're pretty common throughout North Carolina and some of the southern states. And um, they are unique in that when people, you know, when you find their colonies outside in, in the wild, so they're a native species, they live in um, standard forest around here. We, we can find them up towards the Appalachian Mountains. Um, 
their entire colonies are really small. It's usually like a queen and maybe, you know, a couple dozen workers. And sometimes you can find the entire colony living inside a hickory nut. Um, but when they get into the city, they do this crazy thing um, and it's called, they form what, what's called a super colony. And so these massive colonies develop, they produce literally thousands of queens. Um, the, the colonies shoot to multiple millions of workers and then they can take over, you know, an entire city. And so when I was living in Raleigh, North Carolina during my postdoc, I had these odorous house ants living in my house. And then I brought my colony in and introduced them to a colony another student had collected from across the city. And instead of fighting like ants normally do, they were just like, oh yeah, cool. We're part of the same colony. We're this giant super colony that basically has taken over Raleigh. Um, and so, the, and no one actually knows how that's happened. So we know that this is true. When you go out into the woods, they have these really tiny colonies, but then when they get into the city, um, and in, they're very common in Brooklyn and New York. So a lot of my friends in Brooklyn um, complain about uh, their houses being filled with these odorous house ants, but the same, they do the same thing there. They form these giant super colonies. So interesting. Um, this, I think this, uh, well, well, Ian, I see that your hand's up and I'm gonna get to you in just one second, but Mark Guile asked a question that I think is very similar, which is when the food um, that they eat changes, do you see physiological changes in the ants? We actually, well, we don't know. We suspect that there are some changes going on and, and that's reflected why they change from a sugar preference to a fat preference. So there's, there's something that's probably going on there. Um, you know, people ask, is it bad for the ants? Do they have higher cholesterol or something yeah. if they're eating our I hamburgers and stuff yeah, like, like their that? Their BMI increases. <laughs> yeah. And so... Um, so on one hand, I think the ants do better, right? The ants that are eating human foods, they just want calories. They're growing much larger colonies than they would be able to do otherwise if they didn't have that food. Um, but one of the interesting things we've been following up on is to try to figure out why they like fats in particular. We asked, you know, where do ants normally get fats in their diet? And they normally get fats when they eat other insects. So most of the species we're studying are normally predatory or scavengers. And so most of their, their diet would be made up of like dead or dying insects or things that they, they catch themselves. And so we've done this study in New York that we haven't published yet, but we, we gave an ant, ants choices um, uh, again, um, but we gave them human foods and then we gave them dead crickets. So they got to choose between a hot dog, potato chip and cookies, and then just a pile of dead crickets. And when we ran that experiment, it was like 80% of the ants went for the crickets. And so we think that there is something, maybe micronutrients or something associated with insects that, that ants are missing in their diet. I call it the paleo diet for ants. Maybe it's like trying to get back to their natural ways, something that uh, I think a lot of people are trying to do right now. Uh, but in any case, we think that there probably are some pretty interesting differences going on with them, but we're still trying to figure out what those are. Great, thank you. All right, Ian, come on in and ask a question. All right. Well, I think you asked all my European questions that I was <laughs> that I was sucking up. So one thing I did actually miss most of your talk, unfortunately, I was in transition um, mm -hmm. um, or that, so I, I missed it. But did you talk anything about the life cycle of ants? You know, how long does an ant live for? Because um, you talked about them being territorial. So do they carry that memory due to the fact that they were involved in it or was it genetic? Um, and do they put down markers to identify the territory? And if, if they are, depending on the lifestyle, do, do, are they also seasonal? Do they actually have, do they hibernate and that, or does it depend? I know my question is very general and there might be different species, but if you talk about New York, since that seems to be the focal point. Yeah, so that's a great question. So I'll, I'll limit it to the pavement ants, which is the main ant that we work with in New York. Um, and so the workers on average, you know, they live um, as adults, they live maybe um, a couple months. Um, some of them might live up to a year long. Um, but what we think they do when they establish that territory is that that boundary then gets reinforced through pheromones or something else. So it's not like an individual ant has to have a memory of where that territory is because once they get to the stage that they're actually foragers, that's that's the end of their life. So they might only be a forager for a few weeks um, or a month or two, and then they're dead. Um, but another interesting thing about ants is that uh, they, they're famous for being the longest lived of all insects. Um, and, and so we normally think of insects living like that, maybe a couple months. Like if, it, so if an insect lives two years, we think that's a long time. Um, but the record 
is actually a European ant. It's a very common ant in, in people's gardens. It's called the garden, the black garden ant in, in the UK. Um, and they, uh, it's Lazius niger is the species. And the one queen of that, that species has been documented living 29 and a half years. Um, and so some ants have really incredible lifespans. There's predict so that particular ant was kept in a laboratory colony for 29 and a half years. Based on some other studies of ants, we now estimate that some queens are probably living 40 years or more in ants and termites. And so there's some really interesting um, work trying to understand like epigenetic factors um, and other things that are allowing ants to have these incredibly long lifespans um, when, when the workers, you know, usually live a few short weeks or a few months at, at most. OK, thanks. That's interesting. Christine. Sorry, no, I, I was just transferring my device and it changed the video for me. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, didn't mean to call you out. Uh, okay. but I didn't see your head pop up. All right, so I do want to ask a couple more questions on the NASA funding. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's a pretty amazing research that you're doing in that area. Is it something that you pursued them as a funder for the work that you wanted to do, or is it that you knew that they had some they want answered and you thought you might be able to solve it. I, I'm interested in the process there. Yeah, I mean, I think so the reality here is that I was sharing a, a taxi service home from an airport um, it, when I was at Arizona State and the person I shared it with was a 3D printing engineer who and he started talking. We started having a conversation and he was interested in honeycomb and um, I work with bees and I was like, well, I can get you honeycomb. And it turns out he had never actually seen bee honeycomb. And, and that's literally how it started. So this is my, my collaborator, Drew Bate, who's at, who's at Arizona State. Um, and so he had been looking at ways to build lighter weight structures, and he was really interested in this idea of bio-inspired design and looking at natural structures. And, and so once we had honeycomb there, one of the first things he noticed is that, you know, when they print honeycomb in their lab, they usually print it out and it has, it's just standard hexagons. It has these sharp angles um, at each corner. And, and then when we looked at bees, of course, they don't do that. And he thought, you know, well, I don't know, like, let's just test that. And so for me as a bee researcher, I would have no idea where to start. Um, I wouldn't even ask that question. Um, but for him, what he could do was print out a series of honeycombs. And we showed the, the kind of crush test in the video. Um, but he printed them out from having a really sharp corners and then adding a little bit rounding all the way until it's basically a bunch of circular cells that are kind of in there together. Um, and then what we learned from those, those experiments were that um, just adding a little bit into that corner dramatically increased the strength without adding a lot more material. Um, so then once we had that kind of under our belt, um, we were looking for areas to um, to fund this work. And Dhruv is a specialist in 3D printing metal. So that's what his lab, he has this giant room size 3D printer that makes metal parts. Um, and so he knew that um, the aerospace industry was looking for ways to build um, lighter weight parts. And he came to me and said, we should write, write a proposal for this. And so from that, I had to kind of think, well, what am I getting out of this as a biologist? And so we've had, it's been a really great working relationship. So this is actually our second grant from, from NASA, uh, our phase two grant that we have now. Um, and, and we've, our phase one grant was exclusively on honeycomb. Um, we ended up looking at um, wasp nests and stuff like that as well. Um, and then now we've actually added some engineering specialists who um, specialize in bioimaging. So they we have they have CT scanners and they're able to kind of tear apart um, and dig into some of these natural structures in a lot more detail than I would be able to in my lab. Um, and so we've expanded from honeycomb and then now we're looking at things like glass sponges. Um, we are looking at cactus skeletons. Uh, Lufa sponges I'm getting ready to mail up to to the collaborators now. And so we're basically looking at any kind of what we call lattice like structures in nature um, and, and trying to pull out design principles like that little corner rounding from these that they can incorporate into aerospace parts. I know you're new to KSU and so I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but do you have collaborators, especially outside your college yet here at KSU? Not yet, but we're looking. So I do have, um, th there is a faculty member that we've started to talk in, in architecture, actually, because we're doing some work on ant nest architecture. And I have been wanting to, I've been looking for someone to collaborate on this for a really long time at multiple institutions, 
And it turns out there's a perfect person who studies what we call city morphology or the design of cities who's um, in the archite architecture department at KSU. And so we're now just getting some stuff, starting some discussions um, and then we hope to start working with engineers as well. So we have another project where we're looking at trying to apply some uh, machine learning and image classification analysis. And so we're, uh, yeah, if there's any engineers out there who do that kind of stuff, who want to collaborate with us, we are very open um, to doing that. And, you know, I think for me personally, if I was just doing my whole career, I would get bored. And so I specifically seek out opportunities and ways to work with people who are in engineering or arts um, and, and other aspects of science. And I think that's sort of one of the mantras in our lab is that we truly want to embrace this interdisciplinary idea. Um, even the students I recruit, um, my student who's working on the Honeycomb Project, she has a degree in visual arts. Um, and then she had a minor in entomology and had been working with the USDA. And, and that to me was kind of like an ideal pairing, bringing in someone who has a mind partly in the arts and partly in the sciences. So that is something everyone in our lab is constantly kind of, we're, we're trying to always ask ourselves, like how can we reach out and build collaborations and work with people working in different fields? Uh, listen, Clint, I'm having to wipe away the tears because <laughs> this is what it's all about. So thank you. That was a perfect pitch for what we want to establish here at KSU. Great, yeah. Talk, talk a little bit a little bit more about your collaboration with the arts, because I uh, specifically reached out to to some of the deans to make sure that they could hear what you have to say. So tell us about that. Yeah. So so like I said, we're always interested in ways we can engage the public about what we do. And so ants are fun to talk about. We've you know, we, we work with things like the BBC and do documentaries. Um, hear some of these stories. But one of the things that, you know, had always come up when I talk to the public and say, I'm an ant biologist. And uh, very often I, I get asked this question, do you study the red ants or the black ants? And then I have to explain to them, well, there's there's more than two kinds of ants. Um, there's there's actually I think 15,000 species of ants now that we've described, and so I realized that you know most people that they they don't have microscopes at home, they're not looking at ants up close, they don't really know all these differences, and so we decided um, to to actually um, seek out a collaborator in, in the arts to do a project based on these cuticle textures that ants have. So when you look at ant heads, um, they're not just these smooth kind of plain looking ants. Some species have like fingerprint like designs that are all over their face. Some have little like dimples like a golf ball does. Um, some of them have um, just all kinds of, there's all kinds of different spikes and ridges and stuff. And so I ended up working with a fabric, a textile designer at NC State when I was there as a postdoc. And we showed her this beautiful set of ant faces and I thought she was gonna run away screaming, um, but she didn't. Um, she did not seem like the kind of person who was very interested in insects at the time, um, but she got really into it and she created a line of fabric prints that were based on ants. And so it's kind of like if you can think about like zebra print or leopard print, um, where you know you take the print off the animal and then have it on a uh, textile. We want to do the same thing with ants. So I brought some uh, brought some here. So what we actually created were things like these pillows. So we have a threadless shop. Um, this is uh, one of the polyrhachis ant species. This is kind of its head, but like I said, they're a pattern repeat. Um, and she did all these cool colors. So the ants aren't actually these colors. Um, we let her kind of pick whatever color she wanted. Um, she did, I think, six different species. Um, we put these for sale through Threadless and 100% of the proceeds go back into the research. So we've actually used the first round of to fund an undergraduate researcher um, when I was in my postdoc for the summer. Um, we now also have COVID masks. So we, we newly released in the last week. Um, if you need some updated, um, some updated mask, um, check out our Threadless site. And, and like I said, all of the, the profit we get um, off of this goes back into buying supplies to study these cuticle patterns and that's actually what one of my graduate students, J.P. Hellenbrand, is studying right now. So he's in this process of classifying every single pattern found in ants, trying to see how these patterns evolve. And we actually think that they have a function in, um, in interactions with ants and disease and microbes in their colonies. So that's, that's kind of where this work is going. Um, they're not just something cool to look at, but they also seem to have some functions in maybe preventing um, disease um, growing into an ant's body. I love it. I love it. And so I'm guessing you have no collaborators from CODA yet. 
but that's not yet. But I know my students are like bending over backwards trying to. They they they've been going to. I think um, they've been looking into things like the 3D printing labs, and then trying to find. I think like look, we're looking for some laser cutters to do some stuff with, um, and would love 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 any types of artists who want to do collaborations with us who just want to hang out and hear about what we do and maybe get some inspiration. Great. Um, I encourage you to send in more questions or to just raise your hand and, and, and to ask a question if you want. All right, I'll keep going. I don't have any problem with that. <laughs> All right. I a prop that, should I tell you about the prop that I brought besides the pillows? Yeah. I brought yes, of course. Um, so one of the things that I love to show people is this thing, it's called an aspirator. And so this is like when you're an ant biologist, our number one tool is shovels. And so actually when I first got at KSU, the first thing I did was order like 10 shovels for my lab. And I, you know, I was like, what, what am I doing? But that was before we had any kind of like science equipment, we have plenty of shovels. But this thing, it's called an aspirator. And this is what we actually use to collect ants. So if you see my students walking around campus, you know, later this year when it starts to warm up again or see us walking around Atlanta, we carry these around and they're a mouth vacuum. So you put one end in your mouth and then you suck. <laughs> and then the ants go in this hole too. So it's see? just like, so listen, I things you were really cool until you sh told me that you have to use your mouth to pick up the ants. Exactly. Yeah. And this is what I literally walk around New York City carrying this thing up and down Broadway. And I'm like crouching on the sidewalk, sucking ants up. We have this filter. We added the filters when we worked in New York because we didn't want to get any kind of um, chemicals or debris into our mouth. But the ants actually all get caught in here. There's a little screen so you don't actually inhale any ants. And I, I actually I put some ants in here. So maybe you can see some. Um, these are some ants from my yard that we collected before, but um, in any case, this is one of the cool things. And and what I always like to talk about this is when you're walking around using one of these aspirators, like everywhere I've done research, like I've done research in India, I've done research in like protected areas throughout the U.S. You know, if someone sees you, they're like, what the heck are you doing? They want to know more. Why are you huffing like weird things with something that looks like like a water bong or something? I don't know. Um, in New York City, no one has ever asked me in five years what I'm doing when I'm huffing ants off the ground. That's like the one place in the world where uh, people, they just, they, they see you and they're just like, I don't want to get involved in that. I'm going to look ahead and just ignore what's happening. Yep. It's the place to disappear because this no, is, nobody this wants is it, that. Yeah. Yeah. This is it. And I have to drop off into another meeting, but I got two things for Clint. One, I mm -hmm. stuck it in the text. We have a metal printer that we're installing in um, the College of Engineering, and we have a lot of other printers there. So um, if you ping me an email, I'll I'll let you know what's going on there or get you con in contact with somebody yeah, who's doing yeah. that. Yeah. It's still sitting in a big box just now, but we're in the process <laughs> of doing that. As for your aspirator, we could probably get a senior design project or something that can design something that looks a little bit more high tech where you won't have to use suck but we'll have a little pump on it that for you to suck yeah. the ants in <laughs> so um ping me an email and we'll we'll work out what we can do in terms of a senior design team and they can print things you know and put little motors on it to give you something and variable suck because i know as a human being the amount of suck you can have can depend on whether you've been running you know how hot it is <laughs> or that so we could give you a process that's better calibrated that relative, be to the, relative to the type of ant you may want to collect if there's more than one colony there. Yeah, that would be great. That would be super useful. Thanks. Let yeah. me go, go. Bye. Great talk. Thank you, Ian. Um, how about the field station? I know it's not an urban setting, but it certainly is a lot of uh, land that we have access to. You have plans to go out there anytime? Yeah, we're really eager to start some work at the field station. And so we had, you know, I was going to teach a class out there and do some biodiversity sampling um, at the field station before we shut down in spring. Um, and so we haven't got to do that yet, but I have um, my student who's working on our USDA Urban Bee project, we're hoping to include the field station as one of the sites in that. Um, it's going to be looking at a gradient of urban farms from the middle of uh, Atlanta, kind of fanning its way out. And so the field station, even though it's not super urban, it's urban enough that, it, that it's interesting to us for, from that perspective. Um, and he's also going to be rearing bumblebee colonies, which I've never done before, but um, we're hoping to get some bumblebee colonies set out uh, up there in, in the spring. 
Um, and they do keep bees out there. So I think there's a commercial beekeeper right now who has hives up there. Yeah. And so we're interested in finding ways, maybe getting like a club together to teach students beekeeping, um, something like that. But that's something that our the students in my lab have all been talking about. And we're, like I said, pretty eager to get some stuff started up there. And how have you been impacted by COVID? I'm, I'm, I, I'm guessing you haven't been able to go up to New York. So does it are you able to kind of shift gears for a little bit um, or does it just put you behind? We've done, um, and so yeah, we weren't able to do some research we had planned in New York this summer. Um, but, and a lot of the work we've shifted to is, is a lot of work we can do at home from computers. Um, and so we've been doing um, meta-analyses and image analyses um, and a bunch of stuff related to, to, to things that we can use databases and data we've already gathered. Um, but we have, since we do ecology and we work outside, there's a lot of opportunities to collect ants. Um, I was just in southern Georgia two weeks ago to dig up some ant colonies to, to study um, uh, symbiotic yeast that live in, in, in these with these ants. Um, and we were hoping to kind of target some field sites to do some of the projects we're thinking about in New York, but we can do some of them in Atlanta. And then there's some interesting ecosystems around the area we're hoping to tap into this summer with students doing some field projects. Um, two of my undergraduate students just um, with me got a mentor protege award to study antibiotics of fire ants. Um, and so we're able to kind of set up the lab so um, these two students can do multiple or um, complementary aspects of the assay uh, and work together um, while doing social distancing. So I think we've found a lot of way. Uh, it doesn't feel like we've slowed down a lot. Like we don't get to see each other face to face as much as we want to, but we've stayed pretty busy. Yeah, uh, I agree. I feel like most of the faculty that I've talked to have said, well, you know, I worked in the paper that I haven't been, had a chance to work on or I've written the grant proposal that I wasn't able to do. So, um, OK, any other questions coming in from the participants? I don't see any more. Um, so I, I think we're going to wrap it up. I, I want to give you the last word, Clint. Is there anything else you wanted to tell us that I didn't ask? Um, no, just yeah, keep an eye out. If you want to learn more about you know bees or ants in the area, feel free to shoot us an email. Um, e even if it is whatever ants are in your kitchen, we're happy to identify them for you. Um, yeah, and we're just happy to be here at Kennesaw. And thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. In two weeks, we, we're going to be back uh, on October 30th. We'll be having a, another show uh, featuring an interdisciplinary team of Sarah Gaindra Parker and Glenn uh, from biology and Glenn Young from math. And they'll be talking to us about some of the work they're doing with starlings, which is a really cool bird, uh, the starlings of East Africa and how they cope with some of the challenges in their environment. So um, thank you again, Clint. Thank you to my team for setting everything up. Uh, from the Office of Research, I wish everyone a safe and healthy and happy weekend. See you in two weeks. Thank Bye. you. Bye.